Ideas in probability can seem counterintuitive. So, too, can the notion of randomness. Of the following two sequences of heads and tails, which looks the more random? Many people might be tempted to say the first, because it has an even sprinkling of heads and tails arranged in no obvious pattern. The second sequence has an imbalance of tails and longer runs of the same letter. In fact, this second sequence was produced by a random number generator, whereas the first was deliberately constructed to look like what a person might come up with if asked to write a random sequence of heads and tails. A human tends to avoid long runs, deliberately balances the letters and switches from heads to tails and vice versa more often than happens at random. What about this sequence? It may look random, and statistical methods of catching human-produced sequences will conclude that it wasn't made by a person. In reality, it's constructed from the decimal digits of pi, omitting the initial three, with a head for an odd digit and a tail for an even digit. So, are the digits of pi random? Technically, no, because the first decimal digit will always be one, the second four, the third one, and so on, no matter how many times the sequence is generated. If something is fixed and always comes out the same whenever we choose to look at it, it can hardly be random. However, mathematicians do wonder if the decimal digits of pi are statistically random in the sense that they have a uniform distribution all digits being equally likely, all pairs of digits equally likely, all triplets equally likely, and so on. If they do, then pi is said to be normal in base 10, which is what the vast majority of mathematicians believe. It's also believed that pi is absolutely normal, meaning that not only are the decimal digits of pi statistically random, but so too are the binary digits if pi is written out in the binary number system, using just ones and zeros. The ternary digits, using just ones, twos and zeros, etc. It's been proved that almost all irrational numbers are absolutely normal, but it turns out to be extremely hard to find a proof for specific cases. The first example of a known normal number in base 10 was Champernoun's constant named after the English economist and mathematician David Champernoun, who wrote about the significance of it while an undergraduate at Cambridge. Champernoun's constant is made up simply of all the consecutive natural numbers 0 0.1234567891010 1213 and so on and therefore it contains every possible sequence of numbers in equal proportions. One-tenth of the digits are one. One-hundredth of pairs of consecutive digits are one, two, and so on. Normal in base 10 it may be, but Champernoun's constant is obviously pretty bad at producing sequences that look random, especially at the start. Nor do we know if it's normal in any other base. Other proven normal constants exist, but like that found by Champernoun, they've been artificially constructed to be normal. It's still to be proven whether pi is normal in any base, let alone absolutely normal. At the moment, the value of pi is known to about 22 trillion decimal digits. These will never change, no matter how many times the calculation is run the known digits of pi are part of the frozen reality of the mathematical universe, and so they can't be random. But what about the digits lying beyond those that have been computed? Assuming pi is normal in base 10, those unknown digits remain essentially statistically random to us. In other words, if someone asked you for a random string of a thousand digits, it would be a valid response to build a computer to calculate pi to 1,000 places more than is presently known and use those places as the random string. 
asked for another random string of the same length, you could compute the next previously unknown thousand digits. This raises an interesting philosophical question about the nature of mathematical things. To what extent are the decimal places of pi that we haven't yet figured out real? It'd be hard to argue that, say, the trillion trillionth digit of pi doesn't exist or that it doesn't have a specific fixed value, even though we don't yet know what it is. But in what sense or form does it exist until at the end of an immensely long calculation, still to be carried out, it pops into a computer's memory? As a curious aside, it's worth mentioning a discovery made by researchers David Bailey, Peter Borwine and Simon Plouffe in 1996. They found a fairly simple formula, the sum of an infinite series of terms for pi, that allows any digit of pi to be calculated without knowing any of the preceding digits. That seems at first sight impossible, and it certainly came as a surprise to other mathematicians. What's more, a computation of, say, the billionth digit of pi using this method can be done on an ordinary laptop in less time than it takes to eat a meal at a restaurant. Variations on the bailey borwine plough formula can be used to find other irrational numbers, like pi, whose decimal extensions go on forever without repeating. The question of whether anything in pure mathematics is truly random is a valid one. Randomness implies the complete absence of pattern or predictability. Something is only unpredictable if it's unknown, and in addition there's no basis on which to favour one outcome over any other. Mathematics exists essentially outside of time. In other words, it doesn't change or evolve from one moment to the next. The only thing that does change is our knowledge of it. The physical world, on the other hand, does change continuously and often in ways that at first sight seem unpredictable. Tossing a coin is considered to be sufficiently unpredictable that, by common consent, it's taken to be a fair way of making decisions when there are just two possibilities. But whether it can be called random depends on the information available. If, for any given toss, we knew the exact force and angle at which the coin was launched, its rotation rate, the amount of air resistance, and so on, we could, in theory, accurately predict which side would land facing up. The same is true if we drop a slice of buttered toast, except that in this case, there's evidence to support the pessimist's view that toast does tend to land butter side down more than half the time. Experiments have shown that if toast is tossed up in the air, surely something that would only happen in a lab or a food fight, the chances of it coming down the messy way are 50%. But if the toast is knocked off a table or kitchen counter or slides off a plate, it will indeed hit the floor butter side down more often than not. The reason is straightforward. The height from which toast normally gets dropped by accident, waist height or a foot or so on either side, allows the toast just enough time during its fall to make a half turn. So that if it starts out in the conventional way, butter up, it's more likely than not to end up making a grease stain on the floor.